what you wanna believe, then you can leave it up to me, and I'll give you the key. It's easy. Just keep on hopping, keep on rocking, and don't start stopping. Lindsay, I'm so excited to have you joining me on the show today because we're going to talk about some things I haven't dove into, which is some brain retraining, and I'm really excited to have you here. Awesome. I'm excited to be here. So I think we could kick it off by kind of telling your story because um, chronic illness is a really big thing, and it's something that I'm really passionate about, and so your story kind of begins there as well. So can you share that with my audience? Yes. So my story pretty much started out with the diagnosis of Lyme disease. Uh, Up until that point, I was kind of experiencing chronic symptoms as a lot of us do, you know, the fatigue, the, I was getting daily migraines and, and that was kind of ramping up and joint pain, kind of like chronic inflammation, food sensitivities. And this all kind of came on pretty suddenly like it was over a period of months and I just started to get sicker and sicker and a lot of people who are in the caregiving space I'm a physician associate associate by trade so my specialty is internal medicine and so a lot of people really don't think about their own health like a lot of us who push ourselves to our limits or just take care of other people and that's really natural to us So I kind of thought, oh, I was doing a lot of traveling at the time. It's probably jet lag. Well, it was kind of this perfect storm of, you know, just uh, the Lyme bacteria and different exposures to things along my travels, like toxins and, and then also a lot of psychological trauma that was unprocessed. And so it was kind of this perfect storm of trauma, you know, physical mental and emotional trauma and then I kind of went into this place where my body just could not handle anymore you know my um my body wasn't able to take it it was so inflamed and that's when the chronic symptoms started so then I got that diagnosis of Lyme disease So with my background in Western medicine, I went down that route of trying everything. Like really, I went to school outside of Boston, Massachusetts, where, you know, very close to Lyme, Connecticut, I knew a lot about Lyme. And I went down this rabbit hole of kind of going that whole Western route. And I just wasn't seeing any progress. I wasn't seeing any changes. So I started the functional route and I started you know, a lot of detox, a lot of treatment, a lot of like, I was going to three, four different appointments every single day, you know, trying to feel better. And I just wasn't. The symptoms were so severe. And if anything, I felt like I was getting worse or I would progress a little bit and then plateau. So I started to kind of reach outside my comfort zone and look into more alternative um, treatments. And so I tried everything under the sun. It was really so much that I tried, but it wasn't until I read about neuroplasticity in a blog post. So neuro meaning the brain, plasticity meaning malleability, plastic changing. So the brain changes. And basically this process of brain retraining. So when we have a chronic illness, we're constantly receiving the message of danger and our bodies are responding to that danger signal. So we're in this heightened state of inflammation. And when I read that article, like it just was this huge aha moment. Like I love 
you know, people's stories of these like aha moments, these just moments where everything starts to click and you're like, oh, like that's why my body is responding in this way. You know, I always thought I'm like, I'm healthy. Why aren't I fighting this off effectively? Like, why can't I detox effectively? Um, and it became this kind of underlying issue that was going on, which was my brain was constantly communicating this signal of danger, telling my body, and my body responded. So then I started to change my thinking. Okay, well, it may not be the food itself that I'm sensitive to, but my body's responding like this food itself is dangerous. So how do I address that chronic inflammation, that chronic hyperreactivity response? So that's when I started learning about brain retraining. And to me, it felt like such an empowering tool. A lot of times we outsource our healing. So we're going to the chiropractor and we're going to the functional medical doctor. And though these things aren't bad, it's nice to have a piece of your healing journey that you're a part of, that you're in the driver's seat of. It, it can be really empowering. And I have found help to create some of those long lasting sustainable changes to your overall habits your well-being so i went down the route of brain retraining at this time there was like two programs out there about it there was you know i, I started to read about it dr norman deutsch uh, dr joe dispenza is a big one in the brain retraining world and I just started learning as much as I could about it and started to implement some protocols. And over about eight months, I went from being bed bound for a period of a couple months to fast forward eight months later, surfing in Costa Rica, like um, being active, like eating a piece of full gluten, full dairy pizza, which I never thought that I would do again, just living my life. And when I was ready to go back to work as a PA, I, I kind of started working with an integrative medical doc. And I quickly realized like there was a gap that needed to be bridged between the medical community, functional and Western alike. And this information about how we can change our brains, learn to regulate our nervous systems, which a lot of coaches and life coaches talk about. So there was some place in between where I was like, we, you know, we need to connect these two and make it more specific about chronic symptoms. So that's when my company Vital Side was birthed. And that was um, over five years ago now. And so I've been working in the past five years, a lot of times with chronically sick people or chronically stressed people, calming that chronic stress response, decreasing that inflammation and seeing how the body responds then, and then being able to support that body with good food or supplements or whatever it is um, that you'd like to do to support yourself. So it's been super cool, like such a dream you know, passion project of mine. And I've loved to see it thrive like this. So you said a lot of things there that really resonate with me. And I've brought this up in the past there, and maybe you can kind of elaborate on this, but um, there are studies out there where someone per se is allergic to strawberries. And so they'll give them something, but tell them that there's strawberries in it and they have a reaction, even though there wasn't strawberries in it. And it kind of sounds like this is similar to what you're talking about. And I know that I have worked with people in the past where they get so focused on trying to heal what's going on that all of a sudden everything has become bad. And I feel like it's this downward spiral where they're being able to eat less and less things. They're having more and more flares, more and more things are springing up. And so can you kind of elaborate on why that's happening and how it's involved with what you're doing? Yeah, so it can be a conscious kind of thought process, like you mentioned, of like not knowing there's strawberries in something when someone has, you know, a noted allergy of strawberries. 
it can be subconscious or it can be just a physiological response. And so that's what I, I like to think in the terms of like how the body is responding and then using things like conscious thought as a tool to start to rewire some of those processes. So I'll give you an example here since you you used strawberries. So say you did a sensitivity test and it came up red, super sensitive to strawberries. Okay, well, what's going on here? Well, for um, some food sensitivity tests, it could be that you eat tons of strawberries and have naturally become sensitive to them. It doesn't mean it's like a bad sensitivity. It's just that your body is responding because it eats a lot of strawberries. If you are noticing also reactions to the strawberries, like you're symptomatic and you're sensitive to strawberries, okay, well, could it be that your body is in a hyperinflamed state? So on the test, you wouldn't just see a sensitivity to strawberries. You'd see bananas and cucumbers and milk and wheat and um, it's like five plus sensitivities, like very severe sensitivities. Um, oftentimes, like a lot of people I work with come to me with a very limited diet of just eating like plain chicken and water and maybe one vegetable because their sensitivities are so severe. So this is a symptom of a bigger issue, which is this chronic inflammation. So we can be so quick to jump to like changing the diet and starting there, but that could be a Band-Aid approach because your body is not saying, now this isn't for every allergy, um, but for a lot of sensitivities, your body is saying, this food that you're eating is dangerous. And so if we have five or more of these foods that we're sensitive to, it's saying that multiple foods are dangerous. So all of a sudden, all food is dangerous. Now, this can be a, a result of reading tons and different programs about the foods you should be eating and um you know these specific diets and the parameters around the diet so it can be because of that conscious thought causing that stress reaction and causing your body to respond in that physiological stress response to certain foods yes absolutely that's one way um another way is sometimes we don't know why that strawberry and that mango and that cucumber and that dairy, whatever it is that you're sensitive to. But it's, again, a symptom of the bigger issue, which is your body is stuck in this state of chronic inflammation and stress. So then that's, you know, a, a moment in time where I take and I say, okay, let me, let's take a step back. Let's work on decreasing that stress response in your body so your body's not so inflamed so that your body's not constantly communicating your brain sends a message to the rest of your body through neurotransmitters and hormones that there's danger present and the body responds by producing more of those to the point where you can get so depleted and you may be psychologically feeling just overwhelmed you know just so stressed out but physiologically the cortisol stops producing because you've produced so much other stress hormones are responding the immune system gets depleted you know we're not digesting we're not resting right we're not in that state we're in a state of fight or flight we're in a state of stress so first of all it's normal. We can move in and out of this stress response state, but being in a chronic state of stress, your immune system stays depleted, right? We get sicker more often or not sick at all because the immune system's not working, right? And, and so then we can develop digestive issues or maybe then we're diagnosed with an allergy or a chronic condition. So what this is about is really setting your internal environment up for success mm -hmm. so that you can start to do the things that you love again. And for most people, that is eating food that they want to eat again. Mm -hmm. 
can you kind of dive into the deeper realms of how this starts in the brain and how it manifests in the body? Because I think some people don't understand what a stress, where a stress response originates and how it manifests outwardly. So maybe you can kind of take us through that process real quick. Sure. Yeah. So we perceive threats all the time. And, you know, we have all of these capabilities within our brains and our bodies to recognize if something is a stress, stressful event, something dangerous or not. So we perceive our environment through our five senses. And what happens is when we perceive something, maybe it's a smell. Maybe it's an experience that mirrored an experience of the past that was stressful. That's our sixth sense, neuroception. And we're able to determine, oh, this is something that was dangerous, very similar to what happened in the past, even if it's not a conscious thought. That's that physiological response that we're getting through our five senses. So that response goes to the hypothalamus, which sits in the limbic system, the limbic brain. And the hypothalamus is this really incredible um, part of the limbic brain that's able to communicate with the pituitary gland, which is kind of that hormone control center. And so what happens is the hypothalamus sends a message to the pituitary gland says, hey, there's something dangerous here. <laughs> you know, we've got to respond. And our bodies don't respond to things they respond to actual threats and perceived threats in the same way. So if you're looking at this from a conscious perspective, you're not saying, you're not sitting here and saying like, oh, well, that's not dangerous. That's a shark on TV, mm -hmm. not a shark in real life. So I'll use the example because I love this example. Um, I was watching Jaws and my dog was sitting next to me and I've got this hundred pound, like massive dog. And we're like cuddling. And so there's a scene, you know, when it becomes twilight and like the actress Chrissy Watkins is like walking on the beach and then she goes in the ocean and she starts to swim and it's like, you know, gets ominous. Right. And then the music, right. The Donna, 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 Donna. So my dog, of course, he like can't even see the visual, right? He's not like, oh, this is a scary moment. He just through audition, through his hearing, immediately sat perched up on the couch and his ears went up and like he got like his hackles were raised, which is like the equivalent to like goosebumps. Wow. And <laughs> yeah. And, and so all of this was happening and I'm just like, watching and I'm just, you know, I have a smile on my face because I'm like, obviously there's not a shark there but then the shark comes up and there's that kind of you know attack scene and it's one of those things where I, I'm like watching this play out and um that's how we as mammals respond to danger so in that moment what likely happened for him was okay hypothalamus like let's there's danger present I perceive this through this sound because dogs have a heightened sense of of hearing right so perceive danger through this sound then the hypothalamus part of that limbic brain sends a message to the pituitary gland hey danger is present danger or pituitary gland is the hormone control center sending hormones to the rest of the body so um, one of those body parts is the adrenal sitting on top of your kidneys. So then adrenal get the message of danger. Hey, got to respond. And that is where the, cord uh, the stress hormone cortisol is produced. And so cortisol gets released. Adrenaline gets released. Norepinephrine gets released in order to protect you. But in this moment, we're simply focused on surviving. So that's when you can think fight, flight. So heart beats fast. We start to breathe faster. Now we're not focused on digesting food or anything like that. So blood flow gets taken away from our vital organs like our guts, um, reproduction, right? Reproductive organs. 
we're just focusing on getting the heck out of here, right? Like run away or stay and fight. Um, and that last survival response of freeze, which is kind of the last ditch effort of surviving. So watching my dog go through this, you know, and I'm like, okay, thinking about what could possibly go be going on in his body. Well, typically, and what happened with him was like, okay, then the music changed. There's another scene okay, he can go back and relax. Like the nervous system and our our bodies, they're, they're so malleable and they're made to be dynamic. So moving in and out of survival responses through us perceiving the environment. So what's going on around us externally and internally what's going on inside of us. Now, when we have a chronic condition, it's like that shark, that perceived shark is with us all the time. So internally, we may be receiving that message of danger again and again and again. And this also happens with trauma. You know, a lot of times um, I think of trauma in the broader term of like, it could be a physical trauma, like a car accident or an injury or an illness. It could be a psychological trauma, emotional trauma mental trauma. So our brains and bodies perceive this as a threat. So we can get stuck in this state of this stress response. So it's like that cycle, which I just explained is called the HPA axis. So hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis is on repeat and it becomes this negative feedback loop. And then it can get to the point if we're stuck in that state of stress, if we don't move out of it, we can stay there. And that's when we can develop those hyper reactivity, hyper inflammatory symptoms like we were talking about at the start. Mm -hmm. So this is all really interesting, especially because you have so many people coming out now and saying that the root of autoimmune sometimes can be trauma. It's not necessarily like mold or things like that. And can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? So trauma is our body's response to things, mm -hmm. right? So, so everyone can experience the same situation. We respond differently, right? Even just um, in our reactions, but also in how we remember that trauma. So, so that's, or that experience. So that's trauma. That's what trauma is, is, is how, our body's memorized response to a stressful event. Um, and we can get stuck in that state of chronic stress and live in this hyperreactive way. So people, you know, who are coming out and saying, oh, it's likely trauma, you know, maybe in this case, it sounds like you're referring to psychological trauma mm -hmm. was, you know, the, the root of my autoimmune condition, it's absolutely possible. And this is the physiological response that happens. So we stay stuck in that state of chronic stress. So having experienced abuse as a child, putting yourself in, or not you putting yourself into it, but getting into that state of that chronic stress response. And then if you're not proactively addressing it with reprocessing tools throughout your life, it can get to the point where your body's such in this state of this negative feedback loop of stress. And it gets to the point where your physical body is impacted, like an autoimmune condition. Um, but, but I do want to make just kind of with like an asterisk here, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, if you have a chronic illness, jumping into trauma processing right away is typically not the next best step. Just because the physiological responses in your body are so severe, if you are wanting to process trauma, that's wonderful. But sometimes even talking about it or using a modality like we'll use EMDR or brain spotting, you know, great, wonderful tools to reprocess experiences. Um, but your body doesn't have the, the coping mechanisms to 
stay out of the state of chronic stress because of that negative feedback loop. So when you relive some of those experiences, it can be like you're present with them and you can't move out of them. So that's typically when the next best step is something like brain retraining. So I've seen, you know, I have um, a vital side team member who works uh, for me now, but she started as a brain retrainer and she lets me share her story, which is why I'm mentioning it to you. But she and her three kids all had chronic conditions. So she started vital side and she started using the protocols and tools to shift her body physiological state out of the stress response so she was doing the protocols for about a year and then she you know started working in vital side and she's like Lindsay like I think it may be a time to start a trauma processing modality then she started EMDR and her therapist was like you're responding so well like you're moving through this so well I think it's because of this all of the retraining work and nervous system regulation work you did and it, it makes sense to me. Healing comes in layers. And I know that's how it was for, for me and my personal journey as well. I could not have addressed the abuse I experienced as a kid when I was dealing with Lyme disease. Like it just was too difficult. I tried and it would put me into that spiral. So this is kind of the next step before you get to that place, but it definitely is possible. So it's usually a combination I like to think of it as like a perfect storm so you know you've got the psychological trauma mental emotional and then also physical trauma which can be things that we're exposed to so obviously you know when we live in a water damaged home that can wreak havoc on our physical bodies absolutely why some people don't get symptomatic as a result and others do in my experience it's been a result of that perfect storm of that kind of different categories of trauma and the body says i just can't deal with it anymore and then they start to get symptomatic so this makes a lot of sense can you take us down some of the beginning steps of brain retraining are there things that you recommend as far as little things to kind of recenter you? Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So nervous system regulation is like a super trendy topic right now. I love it. I see it come up everywhere. Um, I have, you know, friends who are former nutritionists and now they have brain retraining as part of their program. So it's incredible to see and some kind of basics of of just starting that process of regulating your nervous system, you know, can be things like deep breathing. It can be kind of that stimulation of the vagus nerve as you breathe. So the vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve connecting from the base of the brain to the gut. So that's kind of like that brain gut communication and it innervates all of these places in between. But when you stimulate it, you can actually communicate a message of safety. So that's the idea is with brain retraining, we're communicating a new message. So sometimes safety is like too far off for people to start, um, but maybe it's ease. <laughs> maybe it's, um, you know, a, a more neutral emotion. And so when we stimulate that vagus nerve, we can communicate a new signal. So uh one breath that I love that I always come back to between calls or even on a phone call or something like that is the four-sided breath or box breath. So that's inhaling for four, holding for four, exhaling for four, holding for four, and doing that four times. So I like to do that if I kind of notice that little anxious state or or um, you know, I, I can be more perceptive of it now, but, you know, when I start to kind of feel that tightness, like everyone responds a little bit differently when they feel that danger, my mind can be like a little bit of tightness, like jaw clenching or like, you know, shoulders raising up or something like that. So going through four rounds of the four sided breath, and I love to pair that with a healing scent. So taking a, a scent, like, you can use an essential oil or a candle or 
a fresh herb or something like that. And every time you do the four-sided breath, just have that with you, like in a little baggie or keep it next to your desk. Smell that with the breath. And I love it. This like scent is one of the coolest little ways to change your state. Scent, um, we process scent in the olfactory cortex, which sits in the limbic brain. And that's why, so the limbic brain is the feeling, emotional, reacting brain, and also takes short memories and stores them to long-term memories. So that's why we attach smells to certain memories like I remember being in an elevator and being like I smell my kindergarten teacher and I'm like 25 years old at the time I'm like this is weird um but when we attach uh proactively this smell to this sense of safety doing it before we eat doing it throughout the day doing it where whenever you kind of start to feel a little bit anxious or like checking out or fatigue that's a really good tool to use so i'm going to give you that tool and then i'll walk you through the process of what i go through in vital side so in vital side what i do is i teach the science of how the brain changes when we experience certain life events that cause us this stress that where we hold on to trauma. And then we go through a series of what I call state changers. So this one I just took you through would be considered a state changer. They're more structured. So usually they include um, like a type of movement or vagal stimulation like breathing combined with visualization and some other tools that I use to shift and change your physiology in the moment. And then I walk you through vital side seven steps where it's basically the seven step protocol that you use for a minimum of six months, because that's how long it takes to create new neural networks in the brain. And you move through this exercise daily. It kind of looks like an active meditation, but it specifically signals that limbic brain to calm and to shift and to start communicating a new signal. And what's really cool about it is you can do, like, if you're training to do a certain activity or maybe you're training, um, maybe to maybe you're an athlete and you're wanting to, you know, run a marathon or something like that, we use mental rehearsal at the very beginning. So just like professional athletes do. And then you run through the seven steps to create a f- different physiological response in your body. So now you're responding with ease to this event that you want to do. So it's really cool. We use this like bit of a neural manifestation process as well. Um, But to eat the foods that you want to eat or to do the things that you want to do, complete the activities. So if you are interested in kind of the process of brain retraining and you're like, this sounds kind of interesting and I, w- I want some tools to use in the moment uh reset vital sides reset program is a great place to start it's a seven day retraining course so uh each video is seven minutes or less like very quick videos and we'll leave you with a tool like a state changer to use daily and then just some education around how the brain changes so that's super low price point like very cool place to start Mm -hmm. if you're interested in kind of getting that introduction to brain retraining I think that's a really great thing too because so many people hear about things and they want to implement them but they have no roadmap so that's an awesome thing um as far as like the you brought up scent are there other things that you would incorporate into your brain retraining routine so scent movement visualization, breathing. Um, there's some somatic practices that I definitely use. Are you asking in vital side or just things that people can just use in general? Things that people can use in general when they are feeling that feeling of being closed down. Hmm. Well, closed down in particular, freeze. I can give you one for freeze. So when I think about the survival response is something like freeze, that's the last ditch effort for your body to survive. So You can think about like an animal in the wild who tried to fight off the lion and then their last ditch effort of survival is playing dead so that they can run away at the last moment. So their body like plays dead. 
that's what we experience when we experience freeze. So in order to communicate that signal of safety is to move through it in a way that's kind of opposite of freeze. So a good one, we can use music uh, to utilize a new response. So you can pick out like a lyrical song that you just, or a, a, a melodic song without lyrics that you like that can feel like easy to kind of start to move to, or you can pick out a more motivating song. But the idea is when you feel that freeze response, it's like, okay, let me start to move my body in a way that feels gentle, that feels empowering to me. Maybe that's just like lying on the ground and starting to move my vertebrae or moving my arms. I'm a big fan of like chair dancing or bed dancing or whatever, just starting to move and stretch your body. Play that healing song. So choose that one song and begin to move your body to it so that by the end of it, maybe you're moving your body more. Maybe you're out of your bed. Maybe you're singing along to the song. So you're recognizing a new way of being in the moment and ultimately training your body that in this moment, this isn't something that's scary, something to be afraid of. We can actually move through this and feel better at the end of it. Awesome. Well, if there was one thing you could get out there to my listeners that you want them to know and understand, what would that be? The stress response is normal. Everyone moves through it to some degree. We move in and out of it daily. So if you're feeling super stressed out or if you're super symptomatic, you know, this isn't a time to blame or shame yourself for having too heavy of a workload or, you know, too much on your plate. Yes, there are things that you can do to kind of slow down and start to change your habits, but ultimately we're designed to be dynamic and move in and out of the stress responses. So instead of asking yourself or, or kind of like being hard on yourself and asking yourself, you know, why am I, how did I get here? Like, why am I in this place? Start to rephrase that question into, what is possible for me today? Possibilities for me to move through these responses in a more dynamic and flowing way. So really normalizing it and understanding you're not alone in it. And a lot of people experience this day in and day out. There may be a way to create more flow and ability to be dynamic in your life. Um, but you're not alone in this. We all move through it. I love that. Well, if people want to find you, how do they go about doing that? So you can find me on Instagram at my vital side. There's a lot of free resources in there on there that I give. Um, and then on my website, I have that reset course listed on my website and my bigger memberships that have more comprehensive information for people with chronic illnesses. So that is vital-side.com. And if you haven't followed Lindsay already, definitely go do it because she puts a bunch of wonderful stuff on her Instagram. So that's a great tool right there in and of itself. Cool. Yes. Thank you. Well, I'm so thankful that you brought some of your information to share with our listeners today. And I'm hoping I can get you on another time and we'll dive into some more things in the future. Awesome. Thank you for having me.